Hey everybody, a, a video recording of uh, our opening segment of Outdoor News Radio is about to transpire. Uh, I'm Rob Drusan, you can see Tim Spielman. Uh, he and I always kick off the show here at Outdoor News Radio. We thought it'd be fun to share uh, a video component of this podcast radio show with folks on our social media channels. So please uh, enjoy the next uh, 12 or 13 minutes. That's about how long every segment goes. With that, Tim, you ready to kick off this week's show? Let's do it. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another week of Outdoor News Radio. I'm Rob Jerislein, Managing Editor, President of the Outdoor News Publications. We sure enjoy uh, doing this show every week. Uh, we're, we're with you for 60 minutes. Uh, we're actually doing a little uh, video recording of the first segment. If you ever wonder what uh, Tim Spielman and I look like, the guys who do the uh, opening segment, go to our, our Facebook page, Out, uh, Outdoor News Facebook page, where this will be posted, as well as our YouTube channel, Outdoor News uh, on YouTube. Uh, a full show, uh, we're going to talk with someone from the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation a little bit later. T3, Tackle Terry Tuma will also be joining us, joining us. and then I think our old friend uh, Tim Lesmeister will help me wrap up this week's show. With that, why don't I jump in and chat with the guy on video with me right now, Mr. Tim Spielman. How you doing, Tim? I'm good. Uh, <clears throat> people will probably figure out why we're on radio once they see the video on. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> I've got even... I've got the face for radio. I know people have always told me that. That's fine. It is, is what it is. Uh, we, we got a lot to talk about here during a, during a short segment. Uh, we got the, the trout opener. April 18th is the trout opener. Please don't, don't, don't fish trout before the 18th, everybody. Um, anyway, uh, we're going to talk more about this walleye egg take thing, but the, some initial good news is it doesn't sound like that's going to affect the trout stocking, all, the, all the, the, the trout that the DNR has already raised to release this week in time for the trout opener, right? Yeah, those, those are mostly, uh, and they don't affect the southeast streams too much. These are more put-and-take stream locations, and the reason they can do it is because they can maintain their social distance, um, it's kind of a one man on each end of the operation operation. Uh, can scoop them into the truck, <clears throat> can transport them, can unload them. It, it, they don't have to, uh, I'm sure there's little teamwork going on, but they don't have to stand right next to each other like they would in most other fisheries activities. So that's what, uh, and that's a good thing because you, you need, they needed to get those fish out of the hatcheries and, and into the streams where people can catch them. Yeah, okay, well, it, uh, it looks like a nice weekend uh, for the Southeast. I know Tori McCormick had a, had a story on the front page of this week's print edition of Outdoor News. Uh, of course, had a nice trout photo on the top uh, talking about the, out, the outlook uh, for, for the weekend. Uh, some of that uh, the precipitation we had, sounds like some people a little worried about that. We had some snow in the Southeast, and that, mm -hmm. some of that lingered in the Twin Cities throughout uh, the, uh, the past week here, Tim. Uh, and, and Tori uh, always he, he always likes to use that uh, term how the streams get blown out if you get a lot of you get a lot of precipitation hits and, and blows a lot of silt into the into the streams. I don't know. I'm cautiously optimistic that it was a um, a reasonably well paced melt at the start of the week. Maybe maybe it's not going to hinder things too bad. I don't think it will. Where we're sitting right now, it's been cold enough. It's slowly melted. Um, <laughs> probably a worse scenario would have been if it uh, had all that snow had been heavy rain. Um, so, you know, nobody likes snow in mid April, but, uh, it does look like this is melting slowly. It didn't, we didn't get a big warm up. All it would have been nice, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I think conditions will be okay. Just given that fact that uh, there doesn't appear to be a big runoff, the, the fish, uh, numbers and, and things like that are in really good shape there. So I think it'll be good. Yeah. Let's a uh, little, little cautious optimism, optimism and, of course, I want to urge everybody to follow those social distancing guidelines. I have, you know, covered some trout openers back in my Winona days when uh, it was almost shoulder to shoulder on some of those trout streams in the southeast on the opener. That was back in the day before we had a lot of preseason catch and release fishing when, I mean, no one fished until the trout opener. So, sure. you know, perhaps that's changed a bit down there, I hope. But uh, just remind everybody to please uh, practice your social distancing. Tim, let's talk about the big story of the week. You spent a lot of time on this on Tuesday, wrote a very long, comprehensive story about uh, what the DNR decided to do, uh, something we've covered on and off over the years. I've taken a lot of pictures at Pine River, some of the other sites where the DNR takes the eggs and, uh, and, and 
that's where the stocking process starts. They, they, they pull the eggs out of some of these big female walleyes, and uh, the result of that is, what, 120,000 pounds of fingerlings stocked around the state and 280 million fries, something like that. The DNR telling us uh, Tuesday they're calling that off for this for 2020. Yeah, um, just to throw in the fact that <clears throat> not just uh, walleyes, but muskies, northern pike uh, uh, egg take, and also um, I think a little bit of lake sturgeon. Uh, so it's it's multiple species. Mm -hmm. Walleyes are obviously the, the big one that the majority of anglers look at. Uh, pike stocking isn't nearly as big a deal. <clears throat> um, same with muskies. So, yeah, um, they... they, they claim they uh, tried to look at all the different ways that they could maybe pull it off without and still follow the <clears throat> the guidelines um, the governor's COVID-19 guidelines and came to the conclusion that there's no way they could do it and keep people X number of feet apart and still you know do their thing as uh, Brad Parsons the, the fisheries chief called it it's a highly choreographed uh, process and I'm sure it is. I mean, <laughs> the people who have been doing it the longest probably have this whole routine, you know, they, and they, they probably worked with a lot of the same people and you're standing right next to, next to each other. You're, mm -hmm. you're, yeah. uh, you're stripping fish, you're taking down other data and, and, uh, yeah, I've been in the boat too. And no, you're not six feet apart. Um, you're touching or almost touching and, you know, I, I, people can, uh, view that however they want, but it's just the, the fact right now that that's the recommendation is to stay apart and, and we, we can't do a walleye egg take and do that at the same time. Right. Yeah, I've taken pictures of this process at least a couple times. And yeah, these guys are elbow to elbow. They're, you know, they're transferring fish around, they're transferring bowls around, that sort of thing. Uh, we're doing another video. Abigail Dupe is, is going to be producing that for us uh, later this week. Uh, about the process, using some of those pictures, using some B-roll we got from the DNR also. And I think anyone who views that will understand there's really no way to do this and practice social distancing other than, I don't know, maybe you put all those guys in hazmat suits. <laughs> that might that might be a way to do it, huh? Which probably would be a <clears throat> hazard when you're working on the water, I'm guessing. Right, yeah, or, or on a slippery dock, absolutely. Yeah, Tim, one thing, just as you were talking, I, I thought I, I I took some pictures once of musky stripping going on and that was it seems to me i want to say that was later in the year but maybe i'm wrong maybe that was uh that was spring too muskies spawn in the spring don't they so what, what am i thinking yeah, yeah. They, they they spawn later than pike but right. um yeah but there's there's still a spring a spring spawner yeah and that was another thing brought up i mean <laughs> you could maybe find I shouldn't even say that, but I mean, you could, there there are probably ways, you, totally inefficient ways, uh, regarding walleye stripping. But if you're talking about big pike and muskies, you had takes a couple of guys to handle a big muskie, so um, there were a lot of obstacles besides the obvious ones too. Special segment of Outdoor News Radio here. Tim Spielman and I are recording it for a social media channel, so you can you can watch this on Facebook and and YouTube. Uh, Tim, you hearing any feedback from this yet? Any backlash? Uh, the DNR, of course, is saying that um, you know taking one year off is not going to be the end of the world. Maybe it'll actually mean a bigger year class in 2021. They seem to be implying that it's mm -hmm. early. You you know this just broke yesterday, but uh, you, you, you hearing any feedback yet? Um, not a lot. I mean, the, the more of the feedback came when. This was rumored right. like two weeks ago, yeah. and that's a whole other story. And and how uh, how DNR uh, news gets processed these days, if it's related to the virus, is uh, that's a whole other ball of wax. But um, you know, I I'm sure we'll get a little bit of both. I, like I said, I haven't really heard anything yet, but <clears throat> I think people who are familiar probably do get that one year off <clears throat> is not ideal as Parsons said. But on the other hand, uh, most of these lakes aren't stocked every year for various reasons, um, especially with fingerlings. Fingerlings are, in a lot of cases, contingent on if uh, the year class was poor in a particular lake. Um, but other lakes get them on a rotating, get, get fry on a rotating basis because they, <clears throat> for one thing, that, that enables them to measure the strength of natural reproduction versus uh the years what the stock years so 
if it's one, if it's if it if we were to be two years, I think it it would be more problematic. But mm -hmm. I think one year, and I and I do buy that. I mean, it varies by lake. Nothing is an absolute in fisheries. But when you got lakes that freeze out and you lose a bunch of fish, um, the remaining ones tend to survive better. There's more food for them. They grow faster. Um, and I think that's the theory that if we if we miss year class of walleyes, the the following one is going to be that much better off because you know when you've got next year's little fry in there you don't have the yearlings in there chomping those little fish down uh, so yeah it's not perfect then uh, i don't know it, it was a tough decision it's it's practice that, that that people really really push for i mean we go back a decade or so and we had the accelerated walleye program because we weren't doing enough and i'm sure the folks that uh are are big supporters of of that and uh they'll they'll have problems with it but you know honestly i don't think there was a way out of the box with this um, yeah if you've already got fisheries guys working at home and you're not going to bring them out during when the order is still in effect and say well you need to go to work and plus you are violating uh the guidelines you know so um i'm probably getting a little off topic but well, i guess bottom line is personally i i i It'll hurt, but I don't think it's necessarily the worst thing in the world. I think there are other fisheries-related things that um, are sort of on the horizon that <clears throat> that could be affected that, that might be more detrimental to management than one year off of walleye stocking. Tim, I remember back during the, uh, the great walleye stocking controversies of the late 1990s when uh, we were running commentaries from Dick Sternberg and other folks. Uh, one thing the DNR liked to trot out and tell everybody was that I, I believe it was in the name of in the neighborhood of 70 percent of walleye fishing and walleye success and, and harvest occurs from our non-stocked waterways, especially our big natural walleye lakes like Malak, Red Lake, Lake of the Woods, uh, and then of course our river systems which are not stocked. So ultimately we're talking about a fairly small subset of Minnesota lakes, it's, at least in terms of, of, of acreage and harvest where walleye stocking occurs. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I'm sure we'll hear uh, plenty about that as well. Um, but you know, people like their their uh, nearby hometown lake stocked, and yeah, absolutely, and, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that'll be on the minds of some folks. But uh, I, I guess we we probably won't know if there was an effect for years down the road. You know. But uh, hopefully the next year's class will, will make us all forget. <laughs> exactly. It'll be fantastic next year, won't it? There'll be no worries about it at all. Uh, Tim, before we wrap up, well, you say you got a little turkey hunting anecdote. Uh, the, the season started today as we are recording. On, um, today's the 15th, right? Uh, yes. It's uh, once upon a time it was tax day. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, and, uh, but, uh, but it is a turkey opener, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out uh, doing that as we speak. I'm hoping to get out here weekend after next but uh what, what are you hearing out there i just i just heard uh an interesting nugget from uh our one of our writers larry gavin who went out uh to some public uh land i'm sure a wma near his home in Faribo, where he likes to go on the turkey opener and he said uh when he got there um last year there was no one there this year there were 11 vehicles oh man and he wonders if it's got something to do with the people staying close to home um if it has anything to do with the new turkey rigs where people can pick their season, um, or maybe it's another factor, but he, he just thought it was pretty odd that, you know, in the course of a year, it went from nobody else to uh, potentially 11 other hunters out there. And so uh, he said in the interest of safety, he went home. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a lot of, pro you know, it's really, this this COVID-19 thing, thing is gonna throw a wrench in, uh, in a lot of things, but. You know, the DNR, I think, was hoping to review how hunter habits changed this mm -hmm. year based on this liberalized season, based on the fact you can hunt any time period, you can hunt the whole state. Well, this COVID-19 thing kind of really throws that off, right? Because oh, does, who, yeah. who yeah. knows how people are reacting as a result of that? Are, are a ton more people like, hey, I'm going to take up this turkey hunting thing again because I, I'm sick of sitting in the house or... You know, right. I, I haven't hunted in years, or I'll give it a shot. Um, or and, maybe they're not following their natural travel patterns. Exactly. How does that skew the data? 
in terms yeah, of you will. know data that we we knew was already going to be kind of skewed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it will for sure. I, I think it'll be interesting. Um, you know, when we check uh, licenses, hopefully next week, and find out <clears throat> where people went, how that's changed uh, from last year. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, they keep track of how many people went, which season, and in what area, and. <clears throat> It may, we might see some pretty interesting results come uh, next week and toward the end of the season. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, no, but, it, it is going to be. Right. It, 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 they're not going to get a, a the perfect the, the the picture of the season like they wanted because right. people are acting differently. Exactly. Yeah, differently. And I, you summarized that much better than I than I tried a moment to go. I, I'll tell you what, though, overall, I, I think that's a good thing. I'm I'm never going to be upset about seeing more people out turkey hunting and taking advantage of it. And I, you know, I hope, I hope COVID-19 is one reason. I hope people are saying, you know what, I'm getting back to what's important. That means getting out of doors. So uh, I, I take that little anecdote from Larry as, as a good thing. Yeah, you bet. All right, Tim, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you next week, next week's installment of Outdoor News Radio. All right, sounds good, Rob. See you later. All right, uh, we are going to get in a break. I think we're going to talk about elk in Minnesota and whether or not we need to uh, release, maybe stock some wild elk in North eastern portion of the state. We'll talk about that when we return. This is Outdoor News Radio. And with that, uh, so that, that concludes the audio portion. Thank you, Tim. This will conclude the video portion. That was fun. Maybe we'll, we'll do it again. We'll see how, uh, how folks on social media respond to seeing our lovely mugs uh, on, uh, on uh, Facebook and, and YouTube. Well, if it's anything like social media always is, it'll be a, a mix of extremes. <laughs> <laughs> what, you think there might be some negative comments? Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> Yeah, let's hope not. <laughs> All right, Tim, good stuff. Thanks for, for doing this. Yep, you bet. All right, have a good day. All right, that was uh, Tim Spielman. I'm Rob Driesline. Thanks for uh, checking out this, uh, this little video nugget here of Outdoor News Radio.